You're listening to The Bible for Normal People, the only God-ordained podcast on the internet. Serious talk about the sacred book. I'm Pete Enns. And I'm Jared Bias. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. And uh, just a couple of scheduling notes here before we get started. Uh, First of all... Uh, During the summer months of June, July, and August, Jared and I are probably going to be moving to two every other week, so I guess a couple times a month, uh, rather than every week. And the reason we're doing that is because we have a life, at least I know I do, I don't know if Jared does, but actually I'm willing to go to once a week if you all come over to my house and redo the plumbing, uh, paint the trim, uh, split the wood, and about 50 other things that I need to do this summer, so I hope you'll understand. Guys, one point. Another point in terms of scheduling is that, uh, you know, noticed obviously we've had guests on and that's been great. And other times, uh, Jared and I are just talking about topics that mean a lot to us and we're sort of riffing back and forth. There's another type of podcast, too, that we're planning on doing. And today is the first one. It's just one of us talking. And today you get me. So you've downloaded this already. It's too late. You can't erase these things, I hope. I don't know how it works. But anyway, welcome to. <laughs> the first uh, uh, Pete pontificating podcast, and uh, hopefully there'll be a lot more after this. Okay, so as to our topic, folks, uh, on my website, if you've ever visited it, uh, you'll see front and center, right on the landing page, a picture of me, somewhat obscured, as I think all pictures of me should be. So a picture of me somewhat obscured with the text written over it, the Bible for normal people, and then what is the Bible anyway, and what do I do with it? And those are two questions that I've been asking myself ever since, well, forever, uh, 30 years at least, when I was in graduate school and I started being challenged a bit by the world of biblical scholarship and my ideas about the Bible were being challenged. And I think these are great questions to revisit from time to time. In fact, I think these are questions that never go away, and I think the Bible itself forces us to keep asking these kinds of questions. What is the Bible, and what do I do with it? Those are great questions. Now, you can, you can come at that, those questions to try to answer them from millions of angles, many, many different angles. And the angle that I want to come at it uh, with you today is... Uh, one that, uh, no particular reason, I just like it, and I think it's very instructive and it's helpful for me to deal with those two big questions of what is the Bible and what do I do with it. And that topic is, you ready for it? Monolatry. Okay, don't press pause, stick with me here, folks. Monolatry, it's not a word we use every day, but it's a good word to describe something that's happening all over the Bible. Monolatry, it it comes from a couple of roots. You recognize, of course, mono, one, obviously. But um, L-A-T-R-Y, monolatry, that comes from a Greek root that means worship. So the idea of monolatry has to do with God in the Old Testament, and that there is only one God worthy of worship. This is a theme that is prominent in the Old Testament. Now, monolatry... Don't worry, this gets better. Just hang with me, folks. Monolatry is not the same thing as monotheism. Monotheism is the belief that only one God exists. There are no other gods in existence. Now, here's the kick in the pants for a lot of people engaging this topic maybe for the first time. The Old Testament is by and large not monotheistic. You find hints of it now and then, maybe even a passage or two that seems to be saying there is only one God. But, by and large, a major theme of the Old Testament isn't monotheism, but it's monolatry. Many gods exist, but there is only one God worthy of worship. I think wrapping our heads around this idea, it's just one of many sort of entry points into looking at those bigger questions of what is the Bible? What is it doing? What does it mean to read it well? This is one of many angles we can use to come at it and to try to understand a little bit about the nature of the Bible and what it means to read it well. So let's look at this issue of monolatry together. 
Uh, first, a, a good place to go, a first place for me to go, because I think this is just so much fun, is one of the Psalms, Psalm 95. Now, I'm not going to ask you to turn there because you might be driving or jogging or doing whatever, uh, but maybe when you get home, you might want to you know, look at a Bible if you can. And, and I'll read it here, too. I'll read the relevant passages so we can sort of get into this together. Uh, Psalm 95, and I'm reading from, uh, from the uh, New Revised Standard Version. The first few verses, that'll just give us the feel, right? L- l- let me read this and see if we can pick out the monolatry dimension here, okay? O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. And now we get to verse 3. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. And it keeps going on and on like that. And you've no doubt caught this element in here that's a little bit interesting. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Now, hold on a second. How does that work? Well, it works because the ancient Israelites were monolatrous. Only one God is worthy of worship, even though there are others that exist. And the greatness of Israel's God, whose personal name is Yahweh, the greatness of this God is usually explained by means of comparison with how the other gods are doing. And Psalm 95 is a great example of this. Now, when you, when you have a chance to look at this passage in your Bibles, every English Bible that I know of, at least, uh, it, it uses the word here that we saw also in the, in the New Revised Standard Version. It uses the word Lord when talking about God. And now we need to talk about that just for a brief second because it's important. Um, Lord is spelled, when it, when it refers to God in the Old Testament, Lord is, res, is spelled capital L and then in small caps, O-R-D. Not lowercase, but small caps. Every time you see that, The Hebrew behind it, remember the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, the Hebrew behind it is not a title, Lord, it's actually the divine name, Yahweh. And actually, I'll throw this in for free. Uh, Nobody really knows even how to pronounce that word, Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh is sort of like a scholarly guess at how it might have been pronounced. In fact, the reason why English Bibles use the word Lord, this goes back to medieval Jewish tradition. Because the the Jewish scribes wanted to be careful that people didn't misuse or abuse the divine name, right? That's breaking one of the Ten Commandments. So the way to do that is to make it impossible for them to pronounce it. So they would insert Lord instead of Yahweh, and that's how you sort of avoided that little problem. And English Bibles, um, out of due respect, which I think is exactly what they should be doing, they the same thing, they don't try to reproduce that ancient divine name, they just put Lord here instead. Okay? Now, here's why I went into the whole spiel about Lord. I want to reread these verses in a way that might highlight this monolatry dimension of Psalm 95. I want to reread it by inserting Yahweh wherever it says Lord and maybe reading it with a little bit of different emphasis. Okay? So it begins the first few verses. O come, let us sing to Yahweh. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. See, nobody else's presence. Let's come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. In other words, let's worship Yahweh. Okay, that's great. That's verses 1 and 2. But why worship Yahweh? Well, that's where verse 3 comes in. For Yahweh, why do you worship Yahweh? For Yahweh is the great God, and the great king above all gods. See, none of the other gods can hold a candle to this one. Why? Well, verse 4 explains. Why? Because in his hand are the depths of the earth, and the heights of the mountains are his also. Nobody else's. The sea is his. Why? For he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. See, this Yahweh is the creator. And that's why he's worthy of worship. You see, in, in the ancient world, 
you achieve high God status by being the creator. So what makes Yahweh the greatest of all the gods, and a king above all the other gods, in fact, is the fact that he is the creator. And that's why verse 6 continues, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Yahweh, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. See, Psalm 95 is just a beautiful example, and this is repeated in other Psalms, a beautiful example of Yahweh being worthy of worship over the other gods. It doesn't say these other gods don't exist. In fact, the whole theology, the whole message of Psalm 95 depends on the comparison. Right, so this is sort of an important thing here in Psalm 95, and as I said, in some other Psalms as well. Um, Flip back in the Bible, again, when you have a chance, uh, to the book of Exodus. And this is in chapter 12. This is a story of the plagues. Another example that actually fits nicely with Psalm 95. Another example where this existence of other gods is sort of assumed in the biblical story. And this is in Exodus chapter 12. Actually, we're going to focus on verse 12. But in Exodus chapter 12, we are at the uh, uh, the plague of, of death of the firstborn. This is the last plague. And the plague is uh, introduced by God. And, you know, he's talking here to Moses and to Aaron. And he says in verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. This is Passover, right? I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. Now, verse 12, here's how it ends. Listen to this. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. Interesting. It's it's like the 10th plague is this culminating judgment that Yahweh passes on the gods of Egypt. And you have to sort of, you know, set the scene here. Uh, this is a god of slaves and desert dwellers who essentially marches into Egyptian territory and he starts beating up the other gods. In, in, in essence, that's what the plague story is doing. It's showing how Yahweh the god of desert dwellers and the god now of slaves, can march into the superpower territory of the time and basically beat the daylights out of the Egyptian pantheon. Uh, You miss the theology of Exodus if you minimize that. Okay, like for example, uh, in the first plague is the waters turned to blood, including the waters of the Nile. Well, that's really weird. Yeah, it is sort of weird. But it's not just weird, it's actually making a theological claim. Why? Well, because there is a deity of the Nile named Hapi, and this deity was responsible for the yearly inundation of the Nile, so the water flows over its banks, thus allowing Egyptian culture to survive. Without that water, they die. And what happens in the first plague, but the waters, all the waters, and including the waters of the Nile, are turned to blood. Almost as if Hapi is being slain, or at least an indication of who controls the water. Is it Yahweh, or is it the Egyptian god that controls uh, the waters of the Nile? You know, we're, we're, the first plague here zeroes in right on the epicenter of Egyptian power and its ability to survive. And the first plague says, your God that allows you to exist is at the beck and call of this God of slaves and of de- desert dwellers. Uh, the second plague, remember the plague of frogs, the frogs are multiplying all over the place, which might sound cute from a distance. Oh, these cute little frogs, ribbit. But it's an ecological disaster, number one. But number two, more importantly, theologically, eh, this is another punch in the face against another Egyptian deity. And this is the goddess of fertility. And these names change uh, names, you know, in the course of Egyptian history, you have different names and different kinds of gods. But at one point, uh, the uh, fertility goddess was named Hecate and had the face of a 
you guessed it, a frog. So the Egyptian fer uh, fertility goddess, Hecate, and by the way, not Kermit, as one of my students said once, and they failed. But this, this goddess, uh, Hecate, um, you know, who controls fertility? Yahweh or the Egyptian uh, deity for, uh, for fertility? And fertility is a huge deal in the ancient world, just like water. See, so much of the ancient world is desert. Whoever controls water controls life. Whoever controls fertility controls life. Right? The first two plagues zero in on, on such important elements of the ancient world, and that message is these gods of the superpower of Egypt can hold a candle. Uh, moving to the end quickly of the ten plagues, the, the ninth plague is the uh, blotting out of the sun. Well, the sun god, Ra, was the high god of the Egyptian pantheon, and God just basically takes care of business pretty quickly. Um, then the last plague uh, is the plague of the death of the firstborn, and here too the question is who controls death? Is it Yahweh or is it the god of the underworld, Osiris, in Egyptian mythology? The story of Exodus really, it sings. It, as, as my Baptist buddies tell me, this preaches, right? What makes God so great? Well, what makes God so great is that the other gods don't stand a chance. And so Israel, when you wander into the land later and you have to make decisions, which god are you going to worship? You're going to worship the god who basically immobilized Egypt. Without this idea of monolatry, the theology of Exodus escapes us. It's just a bunch of nice little weird stories about dumb stuff happening. Now, actually, these are attacks on the Egyptian pantheon. Now, we, we can flip over a few pages to the, um, to the Ten Commandments. In the Ten Commandments, in Exodus chapter 20, very famous, we read this. Then God spoke to all, all these words. Then God spoke all these words, which sometimes we translate as commandments. It's the same idea. This is in Exodus 20, verse 1. Then verse 2 continues, I am the Lord your God. And let me just say again, I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me, or you shall have no other gods besides me. See, notice what the first commandment does not say. It does not say, I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. There are no other gods before me. It doesn't say that. See, this, even the first commandment is playing off of this theme of monolatry. You have options. You're in the ancient world. If you're, you know, the Sidonians have Astarte, the Canaanites have Baal, uh, the Ammonites have Molech or Milcom, and uh, the, the Moabites have Chemosh. All the nations have gods. You've got your choices. Now, when you're entering Canaan, probably the big temptation is going to be Baal, the god of the Canaanites. But Yahweh says, I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Therefore, you shall have no other gods besides me. In other words, you will worship me exclusively. The second commandment continues in, in a similar vein. It says, you shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that's on the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Why? For I, the Lord your God, am a, here's the thing, jealous God. See, if these other gods don't exist, what's he got to be jealous about? Right? So, monolatry makes sense of these commandments. You've got choices. You can worship other gods, you can worship idols and all that sort of stuff, but don't do it. Why? Why am I worthy of worship? I'm worthy of worship because I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. You've got choices. Make the right one. All right. Uh, this, this idea, this theme continues in the books of First and Second Kings. Right? Again, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but actually I don't mind beating it quite dead because I think this is a very important point. In First and Second Kings, the... The, uh, the judgments that are passed on virtually every king of the north and of the south is what? 
encouraging or advocating or supporting the worship of the gods of other nations. In fact, if you look at uh, 1 Kings, this is the end of the story of, uh, of Solomon, like around chapter 10, chapter 11, um, the downfall of the kingdom of the united monarchy under Solomon, at least one of the elements of the downfall, was that he introduced the worship of foreign gods into the land of Israel. And that's a bad move. You see, th- this is this is an ever-present issue in th- with with the ancient Israelites. You've got you've got options, and monolatry makes it clear that yeah, these are, you do have other options, but you need to only worship one God. See, it's it's sort of like I mean, we don't have much to compare that to in today's world, but I mean, maybe maybe an analogy will help here. You know how banks advertise. You know, banks on TV advertise or in the newspaper, or whatever, they'll say, listen, bank with us, we're the best, here's why. If you were to tell people today, we're the only bank in town, no other banks exist, people will think you're crazy. What do you mean there aren't banks? We see them all over the place. You know, there are three banks on every block, there are 15 ATM machines on every block. These things exist. See, that's part of our culture. That's part of our world. Well, it works the same way in the ancient world talking about the gods. What do you mean there are no other gods? I see them all over the place. There are temples here, temples there. There are idols here, idols there. These things exist. So the way to get the point across, let's say, to ancient Israelites about the worship of Yahweh is to compare them. Right? No, this is a better god, and here's why this god is better. Okay, two other quick examples, if you will indulge me. Um, the book of Job, right? Chapter one in the book of Job. Um, this is, you know, the famous story of Job's suffering, but, uh, you know, it begins with sort of a heavenly board meeting. And uh, this is, can be a little bit weird and unsettling, you know, this is heavenly board meeting. You have here, in, for example, in chapter one, verse six, one day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan also came among them. And Satan is, is, you know, just a side issue here. Satan is not the pitchfork and red tight guy who's the king of the underworld or something. Uh, Satan is just a Hebrew word which means something like an accuser or an adversary. Think of him as like a prosecuting attorney because here's what's happening in the book of Job. God has what looks like is a weekly board meeting and God's the, the chief executive officer. And they're having this meeting and he's bragging about Job, how great Job is. And the accuser says, yeah, well, he's only great because he's got everything he needs and his life is cushy because you're basically a helicopter parent making sure never, nothing ever goes wrong with him. If you make his life difficult, you know, he's going to fold faster than Superman on laundry day. See, the point is that <laughs> there is a heavenly board meeting. That's really the point. And this accuser is one among other heavenly beings that – you know, Yahweh apparently has some charge or some authority over. Boy, do I wish the Bible came with footnotes. I mean, real footnotes, not not the kind that we put into our study Bibles, but footnotes from the ancient author saying, hey, you people living a few thousand years from now, let me explain what's happening here. We don't have that. We have to put the pieces together. But Job 1 and Job 2, where you have this heavenly scene, it just assumes the existence of other gods. It doesn't even uh, debate them. It is what it is. Uh, one more quick example, and that'll be it for the examples. But in Psalm 82, another one of my favorite psalms for showing this uh, begins in verse 1. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. So here we have the scene, again, with, with Israel's God, taking his place in the divine council. I just, again, I can't help but envision, um, you know, sitting down to a board meeting where the chief executive officer comes in and sits down. And you never know what's going to happen when the chairman of the board sits down and he's got a scowl on his face. And that's pretty much what's happening in this psalm, right? He sits down in the midst of a God, in the midst of the gods, and he holds judgment. And this is what he says. This is, this is God Israel's God talking to these other divine beings in this divine council. He says, How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? In other words, how long are you going to let people get away with stuff down there 
How long are you going to let them be unjust and show partiality to the wicked? One of the worst things you can do in the Old Testament, by the way, is show partiality, especially to the wicked. So here's what they're doing. And he says, Yahweh continues, he says, Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Uh, and then he continues, the psalmist continues, he says, They have neither knowledge, these are the other divine beings, they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. And then finally God addresses these gods again. He says, You are gods, children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. See, you're not doing your job, and God is going to cast judgment upon them Basically, a death sentence for not doing their job. Now, that's sort of a, a, a interesting psalm. And if you know, uh, Jesus cites this uh, in the Gospel of John in, in a way that's interesting all on its own. But here, the only thing that we, I want to point out is that, you know, here again, it's this assumption that this is happening, that there is this divine counsel and God's mad at them and he lets them have it. And that doesn't work unless you assume that there is a, um, a, a a multiplicity of divine beings out there. And what makes Yahweh great isn't that he's the only one. What makes him great is that he is in charge of and better than and more powerful than all the others. Well, those are some examples of this theme of monolatry that is so prominent in the Old Testament. And again, I picked it just because I think it's interesting and I think it illustrates uh, what goes into answering these questions of what is the Bible and what do we do with it? So let's just, in the few minutes that we have here remaining, let's explore a little bit those two questions that we began with. What is the Bible and what do we do with it? So first, let, let, let's, how does this affect how we understand what is the Bible? Well, let me, let me say this. Let me start off by saying this. I, you can do what you want, but I... <laughs> I don't believe that God ever holds a heavenly board meeting. I don't believe that there actually ever was in reality in existence a deity of the Nile or a fertility goddess or a god of the dead. I don't believe that. But what I believe is irrelevant for this question. I might not believe it, but I believe that the Israelites believed it. And that's basically the point. You know, what is the Bible? Well, we can answer that question a lot of different ways, but one thing I think we can't escape, and that is so important for understanding of the nature of the scripture, is that it is very much culturally informed or culturally situated. I might not believe these other deities existed, but the Israelites did. Again, it's sort of like the banks and the ATM machine thing that I said a few minutes ago. They assumed the existence of other gods the way we assume the existence of an economic system based on cash and credit with banks and ATM machines and things like that. Nobody calls that into question. Not in our culture. Same thing in the ancient world. It would have been nonsensical to say to the Israelites, you know, none of these gods actually exist. They're figments of people's imagination. Now, you get to those kinds of statements maybe in a couple of places in the prophets, like in Isaiah and Jeremiah, and, and that's fine. That's great. I'm not convinced those texts, uh, like, uh, well, I'm not going to get into that. I'm, I'm not convinced that the Old Testament is truly monotheistic at any point. It might be. But even if it is in a couple of places, that doesn't in, at all take away this monolatry idea that we've been looking at. So they're both. Maybe Israel's notions of God developed and progressed over time. Certainly by the time you get to Jesus' day, the Jews are monotheists. They're not monolatrous. They're monotheists. And that made a difference in also how they thought about their theology and their God and their place in the world. But in the Old Testament, what we have is we have the, uh, the, the faith in God, the belief in God expressed in ways that make sense culturally. 
And this is why, and not to go off on this in any length, maybe we'll do a podcast on this one day, but uh, this is why for me, inerrancy is not a helpful word to describe how the Bible works. I don't think inerrancy, no matter how you slice it, really addresses or can address this notion of monolatry, that the Israelites believed something that wasn't ultimately proven to be true or real. It's who they were at a point in time, and we respect that. We don't minimize it. But to say, well, are they in error? No, they're not in error. They're ancient cultural beings living in a tribal culture where everybody had high gods. And this is how you talk about God in that context. I I say this in The Bible Tells Me So, uh, that the, the Old Testament looks the way it does because God lets his children tell the story from their point of view. So I think, you know, what is the Bible? I think this this gets at it pretty well, this notion of monolatry. It helps us understand that the Bible is always reflects the cultures, always refle- reflects the cultures in, in the Old Testament, and we really can't escape that. In fact, if we don't take that seriously, we'll miss the theology that the writers are putting there. Isn't that ironic? By by keeping the Bible distant from its culture, we'll actually miss the theology that these encultured theologians were putting there. And as I never grow tired of saying, this should not be a shocking thing for Christians to take hold of, because our entire Christian faith is rooted in God entering into and taking upon himself culture. Of course, I'm talking about Jesus here. Not just Jesus became man, uh, rather God became man in sort of an abstract philosophical sense, but in an uncultured person, a first century Jew living in the context of the Greco-Roman Empire. See, you're always having culture and our expressions of God sort of there together, and it's hard, in fact, it's impossible, I would say, to separate them. I expect the Bible to demonstrate something of this incarnating God that is so basic, so fundamental to the Christian faith. No, you might not be getting God straight, so to speak, but you're getting the expressions of God on the part of the people who are writing it. I guess that's really another way of putting it. The Bible, you know, what is the Bible? It doesn't really work well as sort of this deposit of knowledge where every verse has eternal validity. What we're really doing is we're watching an ancient journey of faith on the part of these ancient people, reflecting on God as they understood God to be, and we can learn from that, which I'll get back to in a second. So maybe that's one way of coming at the question of what is the Bible as we're being pushed to answer that question by looking at this one issue of monolatry. It has to be explained somehow. And I think it's best explained by saying the Bible is a part of its culture. Now, the harder question is, okay, well, what do I do with it? Thanks for ripping the Bible apart to me, Pete. I mean, what, what do I do with this stuff? What do I do with a Bible that is so ancient. I mean, how do I connect with it? And a couple of things I want to say to that. First of all, this infuriates my students, but I'll say it anyway. That's a really good question. Welcome to Christian theology. Welcome to either Judaism or Christianity that has always had to struggle with what bearing this ancient text has on our contemporary life. This is the task of theology. The very fact that we ask the question, gee, what do I do with this? That doesn't mean it's a bad idea, this monolatry stuff. It just means that we have something to talk about, and we really, really do. We can't minimize the problem by saying, oh, gee, gee if, if this stuff is true, what do I do with the Bible? Well, that's, that's what we get to think about in community and with utter seriousness and with an attitude of submission to God. Now, in terms of, let's say, a theological takeaway, I can think of a couple. And again, this is a work in progress. You might disagree. You might see other things that I'm not seeing, which is fantastic. But uh, I think one thing to see here is is how uncompromising and relentless this worship of God was in the ancient world. Again, Everybody believed, every ancient culture believed in multiple gods. It is absurd to think that Israel escaped this. 
But in the context of that world, the Israelites are told, no other God is worthy of your time. Only bank here. In fact, only use this ATM machine over here. That's the only place where you go. This is the best for you. Don't go anywhere else. I think that is a relentless comment on the um, attachment we should have on God or strive to have on God, an exclusive attachment. And we have our own gods of other nations, so to speak, that get in the way. And, and you know, any time we have... Uh, something in our lives that is challenging a true devotion and a true trust in God. And it can be, you know what it is, it's whether your yacht or your house or your car or your career or your status or your education or anything like that. See, this is like, those things don't have a place. We cannot put our trust and our confidence in any other rock, as Psalm 95 puts it, than God. And and that is a hard thing to do. It's as hard for us to do today in our cultural context as it was for the ancient Israelites in theirs. So that's, for me, that's one big theological point that I take home from this. And the second, and we're, we're going to wrap it up here, the second thing that I think is very important here, sort of a takeaway to answer the question, well, what do I do with it? Well, I think, if anything, it, it can enlighten us to see really what I mentioned before, that we are always, including the biblical writers, we are always perceiving God from our own setting. We are always perceiving God based on, maybe not based on, but at least deeply and subtly and even unawares engaged in our own cultural moment. When I taught seminary, uh, you know, I thought I was sort of just a normal person teaching seminary, and what I sort of said is a normal thing to say, like, here's what the Abraham story's about, or this or that. I remember one day, students, and, and there was a large Korean population uh, at the school, and also African population, and one day after class, a, a group of students approached me, and I forgot what we were talking about. It might have been the Abraham story or something in Abraham, but they asked me about, well, how does this affect our understanding of ancestor worship? And inside, I was saying, well, that's a dumb question. It has nothing to do with ancestor worship. Why are you letting your cultural sensitivities cloud how you read the Bible? That's ridiculous. I didn't say any of that. I tried to engage it, and I basically said, I have no idea. But it, it took me a, a while to figure out that, my goodness gracious, they're asking a question coming out of their own existence, which is where all theology comes from, out of their own existence and out of their own attempt to commune with God in a meaningful way. I was no help to them, not because I was doing sort of straight theology and they were doing weird theology, but I wasn't even aware of how, you know, white, male, Eurocentric my approach to the Bible was. And it, that became sort of a wake-up call for me that we all have um, this cultural embeddedness when it comes to the theological task. It's inescapable. And, you know, as a result of that, we can have an attitude which is not like the attitude I had for my students that one day, even though they didn't know it. I hit it well. But um, they, um, you know, we, we, can, uh, we can see that people come at things from different points of view based on their cultural moment. And we can actually embrace that as something that's good and true. And if anything, be more understanding and more tolerant of diverse points of view when it comes to theology, because we're all coming at it with baggage, we're all coming at it with an angle. And what if, I'm just riffing here, what if God's actually fine with that? What if the point of all this isn't to find the theological answer, the one answer in this text? Maybe the point of all this is to engage it from our own point of view. Boy, I could go on and on like that because I see the Bible itself doing that. The same stories are told from different points of view depending on who's telling the story when. That's why you've got two different histories of Israel in the Old Testament, Samuel Kings and then Chronicles. They're telling it from a different point of view because all theology is culturally rooted. That's why you've got four Gospels because they're different communities and different things are being told about Jesus. That's why the New Testament writers interact with the Old Testament in such seemingly haphazard and creative ways because the context of the first century calls for a different way of understanding these texts. See, you know, 
All this starting with menolatry. This is weird. Yeah, it is weird. Let's dig into the weirdness a little bit. And let's understand that why that the task of theology is always ongoing. It's never just cite some verses that have this brute, solid, one single meaning. But let's engage the text with an, an awareness of where we're coming from and what God is saying to us and what God is speaking to us now. So, the Bible, I don't think it works well as a rule book. I don't think it works well as sort of this deposit of objective information about God. I think it does work well, though, as a reflection of the life of faith of those people who wrote it. And there is an awful lot for us to learn there, not only about their context and their situation, but our own. Our expectation of the Bible is one that assumes it's coming out of those cultural moments. And reading the Bible is never a substitute for God's presence in our lives. It is never something just read the Bible and you have it. The Bible is not the end of the game. It's actually a means towards another end, which is communion with God in our time and place. The Bible helps get us there, not by giving us the information necessarily, or not so much always giving us the information, but by modeling something about the very task of theology and the worship of God. Okay, folks, thanks for listening. We're going to come back to this stuff again and again and again. You're going to be so sick of it, but I'm not. I'm going to keep talking even if none of you listen. This is a very interesting topic for me. And thank you for joining me. And uh, we will uh, get together again next week. See you.